Conservative. Constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. And welcome, everybody, to another amazing day here on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Of course, I'm so glad that you've joined me here today. Make sure, though, that you're sharing this show with others, spreading the word, telling them to tune in no matter how they do in order to stay up to date on everything that's going on right here in Kentucky. As always, I do encourage you to reach out to the show by emailing info at theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's info at theandrewshow.com. Yesterday, I had spoken about a few things that I want to go over again. One thing I spoke about, of course, was Eric Dieters running in the primary against Thomas Massey for Congress. In that segment, I talked about uh, Eric Dieters' voter file appears to indicate that he may not be eligible to run. Uh, Since Eric Dieters has gone online and has proclaimed and has told the press too as well, that he did change his filing registration in uh, enough time before January 1st, and that they uh, haven't updated, I guess, the the file yet, and it should be updated on January 9th. So he may be on the ballot against Thomas Massey. Um, he seems to indicate that he, he did change his registration in enough time from independent, but we shall see uh, how that plays out. Um, if so, it'll certainly make for a very interesting primary to watch all the way around. Um, there's something else though. On Friday, I went up to the Capitol and, uh, I was, I was with one of my friends, um, Kelsey rock. Kelsey, uh, is running. He's, he's a very, uh, good guy and he's running against Michael Meredith for state house seat. Michael Meredith, terrible voting record, awful representative, certainly somebody who needs to be taken down. Uh, after I got home though, from being up in Frankfurt on Friday, I saw he had posted this video uh, with some explanation, but let's take a listen. We're here at the Capitol. Today I filed my paperwork to run for state representative in Warren and Edmondson counties. And as you would imagine, guess what? We are farmers, so of course we brought baby piglets to the Capitol today. (laughs) So... Uh, he is a farmer, and uh, apparently one of their uh, pigs, one of their sows, gave birth to some pigs, but rejected them. And for anybody who farms pigs, you would know that uh, when a, a sow, not that I farm a whole lot of pigs, but <laughs> uh, when a sow rejects piglets, uh, they have to be bottle fed. And that requires a feeding every hour. And they still, as a family, went up to the Capitol to go ahead and file to run officially. And, you know, it's a family affair. You don't want to leave anybody behind. His wife and kids came with him. So, of course, they had to bring the piglets to make sure they stayed bottle fed. Now, he did say that they made it uh, back in time, back back find, back to, to Bowling Green area, Warren County area, and, and everything's okay with him. What is funny here is I was with Kelsey for an hour or two. And this whole time, <laughs> apparently, there his wife was walking around with pigs in a bag, um, and and nobody told me. <laughs> he never even mentioned it. It never even crossed his mind to tell me that he had pigs on him. And if that's not enough reason to vote for the guy already, of course, Meredith, Representative Meredith, awful. You, sh- you shouldn't vote for Meredith anyways. But ever there was a good reason to vote for somebody, that might be it. And while I think it might be the first time that live pigs have been uh, in the Frankfurt Capitol, I perhaps don't think it's the first time, obviously, there has been pigs uh, in the Capitol, if you catch what I'm saying. Of course, many, many of our representatives and senators, one could describe as uh, greedy pigs trying to suck up money from us, the people, as much as they can. But anyways, I just thought that was pretty humorous and worth mentioning, uh, especially because, well, I was uh, <laughs> I, mean, I was up there. These pigs were next to me the whole time. I would have liked to have pet a pig. Wouldn't you have liked to pet a baby pig while you're up there? I would have liked to hold the pig while I was taking the picture. My only question is how'd they get it through security? Because obviously they check bags. Now, 
obviously security in Frankfurt is not, I don't know exactly why they exist in the way that they do. They exist up there security throughout, but at the door, you know, they, they have you walk through metal detectors, which there, that is probably the most useless thing in the Capitol is the metal detectors because it is legal for you to open or conceal carry a firearm in our state Capitol in all the Capitol buildings there. And so when you walk into one of these buildings and you say, Hey, I'm armed. They just wave you through anyways. You set off the metal detector. They're like, Oh, you go ahead. So literally why have a metal detector? What are you checking for? Because you don't, if I tell you I'm armed, you're just like, okay, come on through. What are you checking for? Why have these metal detectors in the first place? And they have another weird rule too, as well, outside of still having metal detectors, even though you can legally carry a firearm with you in there, they also limit how many rounds you can carry, which just tells you that this was obviously a policy created by some idiot who doesn't know anything about firearms because the current rule is you're not allowed to walk in there with more than the magazine that is in your firearm. So basically, let's say you want to walk in there and you've got your, your 1911 and you're carrying an extra mag or two. Well, they'll tell you you've got to go put those extra mags back. You're only allowed to carry uh, what is in the gun, which is crazy when you think about it because, for an example, my father and I went up there. Uh, I was carrying my Glock 17, uh, which obviously takes, uh, you know, 16, 17 rounds. And my father was carrying a, a firearm that was a single stack, um, you know, nine millimeter pocket kind of, you know, carry gun. I was carrying a full size gun that only took like seven rounds and he had an extra mag on him and he made the mistake of telling him he had an extra mag on him. And so he had to go back to the truck and drop his extra magazine off because he was carrying too many rounds, even though, even though, even with both his magazines combined, I still had more rounds on me. And not to mention, one time I'm going to go up there. I've got a, I've got a Glock, uh, a 31 round Glock mag. I'm going to bring that up there next time and just have it massively sticking out the end of the gun and be like, look, there's one magazine. Okay. <laughs> it's 30 rounds, but it's one mag. You know, it's more than, than probably, you know, two or three mags and most people's guns, but you know, Hey, Hey, it's one magazine. It's just an absolutely silly, stupid rule. Uh, obviously put together by people who don't understand firearms, but so often that's what we see from the government. People who don't understand guns attempting to tell us all how to hold and regulate them and so on and so forth. Now, yesterday at the beginning, i mentioned that the Republican party of Kentucky put forward a pretty, uh, intense resolution, when it comes to uh, January 6th, they had a meeting actually on January 6th, just happened to be on that day, uh, one of their, their statewide convention meetings, and this resolution came up. And now the, a little bit of a compliment sandwich here. Uh, I'm glad the resolution passed. It passed narrowly. We'll go over that here in a bit. But it does send a message that this is a pretty big change, I think, from prior state chairmanship. I mean, we've gone over in this program regularly how abysmal Mac Brown was as far as representing actual conservative views. I mean, he has given interviews where he says he supports more funding to Ukraine. He's given interviews where he says he hates Trump. He's giving interviews where he says that we need to add exemptions for abortion, giving up ground on the abortion issue to allow some baby murder because, well, he just feels like that's what we need to do. And, and the list goes on and on. And, and, and when you combine all of his views together, you saw Mac Brown was very much so in a, a, a very small minority of Republicans not representing anything. And that explained a lot of why the Republican Party of Kentucky didn't represent their base voters. And at the same time, why those who were in touch and, and those chairs and, and vice chairs and what have you, that actually represented the base Republican voters' viewpoints were being pushed out so much. But Mac Brown, he stepped down, and the new chair took over, Robert Benvenuti. And the fact that this came forward for a vote tells me that Robert Benvenuti is a massive change, and he's at least willing to allow the debate, debate on a topic. I don't know if he supported the resolution or not, but most importantly, he allowed the debate on the topic, which is what the chairman should be doing. The chairman isn't there necessarily to somehow act as a body, right? It depends on what you think the, ch the, the party's there to do, but the chairman isn't there necessarily to act as some sort of guiding light of principle to the rest of the Republican party, um, especially when they're ineffective and so disconnected, but they're supposed to be. 
and he's there to represent the will of the base voters. So we'll be covering what this resolution is after this short break. You're listening to the Andrew Kubrater Show, your source for Kentucky politics. And you are back with the Andrew Kubrater Show, your source for Kentucky politics. As always, if you want to reach out to the show, feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's info at theandrewshow.com. So the Republican Party of Kentucky narrowly passed uh, a resolution uh, on Saturday that has certainly caused uh, some waves and some mashing of the old twofers from the of the teeth from the liberals in the state, absolutely, and just across the country, really, uh, losing their mind. Um, and it's a resolution on some statements regarding January 6th uh, in general. And really, if you if you look at this, and if you're an objectionable person, objection, objective person, objective person, you would not have a problem with the resolution in and of itself. But of course, any time, I mean, I mean, okay, follow me here, right? Do we believe, do I believe that uh, Black Lives Matter rioters that destroyed public property, burned things down, committed acts of violence, do I believe they should be held accountable for those actions? Absolutely, 100%. But do I believe that everybody who showed up earlier in the day for a Black Lives Matter rally uh, is somebody who deserves to be thrown in jail, is, is necessarily a bad person? No, I don't think so. I think they're probably confused. They misunderstand. They've been lied to by the media, manipulated, so on and so forth. But I personally would never claim that just a protester that isn't doing anything illegal, not blocking streets, uh, not, not destroying property, not causing violence. I personally would never demand that these people be uh, uh, thrown in jail. I would I would never group all of them together because I know it's not all together. And I would never be saying every single person that shows up to a Black Lives Matter rally should be investigated and thrown in jail. But that is exactly how those on the left feel because, of course, they are, as we all know, very tyrannical. So here's the resolution in question. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I'll read it for you. So the title of it is a resolution acknowledging the events of January 6, 2021, the United States Capitol and recognizing the citizens who have been held without due process. It starts off by saying an identical resolution as offered in the Kentucky State Senate by esteemed Senator Lindsay Tishner, good senator, from District 6, acknowledging the events of January 6, 2021, the United States Capitol and recognizing the citizens who have been held without due process is what it says. Whereas citizens... From across the United States, including this Commonwealth, exercise their First Amendment rights of free speech and assembly to express their frustration with the electoral process on January 6, 2021. Okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, there was plenty of citizens that showed up there at a political rally using their First Amendment rights to gather and to protest. That is 100% allowed, and those people should not be subjected to harassment by our federal government, but... That's what's going on. We'll continue, though. Whereas many of the citizens who assembled on January 6, 2021, have been wrongfully detained for exercising their constitutional rights. And this is very true. I, I invite you to watch the documentary Police State and others where they interview these real people who did nothing. They show them on video, literally doing nothing. Like people who, who either were just on the Capitol grounds or people who didn't destroy any property, didn't assault any police officers, didn't do anything wrong. They simply walked up to the Capitol building and said, oh, it's open. I guess we can go in and walked around inside and then walked out. For those of you who say, well, they should be held accountable. I've been to the Capitol. You've maybe been to the Capitol in DC. I'm going to tell you this much right now. You can go in there and tour the place. That's not odd. So I, I could see how a person with no ill will and without trying to break the law showed up at a protest at the Capitol and saw that there was a Capitol, the Capitol buildings open and was like, Oh, I guess we're protesting in here. I mean, we protest. I've protested inside of the Frankfurt Capitol building before I've, I've done it several times because you're allowed in there to protest. So obviously in DC, I I'd have to assume you should be allowed to protest, right? I would think that would be okay. I would think that maybe it's not, but I'm just telling, I'm just saying from a general standpoint, from how a person could actually process information. And if and if you're somebody who shows up to rallies and things, it would be very reasonable for a person to assume you can go protest inside the government building that's the people's house. It would be assumptive. 
maybe maybe it's illegal, like I said, but I could see it. And continues, whereas many of the J6, January 6th protesters, including many citizens of the Commonwealth, have been unconstitutionally held without the right to due process and right to a speedy trial by a jury of their peers. Accurate. They're being held in D.C. A lot of times, like I said, I invite you to watch Police State. They talk to these people who were held for months on end, uh, you know, subjected to FBI, full armed raids, like an old man just living at his house, minding his own business, has not a single uh, criminal record at all, at all, period, who simply stood on the grounds up at the Capitol getting full SWAT FBI raids. That's too far. That's too far. That's too much. Um, whereas the 5th and 14th Amendment of the United States mandate that a person shall not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, and whereas information on the events that led to the January 6, 2020 riots have been rapidly evolving as more becomes known to the public, it was actually very accurate too as well. As we know, you know, you, you've had Congressman Thomas Massey trying to nail him down on this saying, was there federal agents there? Did federal agents help incite the riot, incite the illegal activity? And for those of you who didn't see it, the FBI director was like, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm not allowed to tell you. Yeah, ask some questions. There's recently been a lot of footage released too as well. They bring that up. Um, whereas as much of the information to which the public has a right to know regarding January 6th has been withheld from the public and the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Michael Johnson, has released footage of the events that led to the January 6th, 2021 riots so that the people can make intelligent and informed conclusions about what happened on January 6th and whereas in spite of efforts to provide all relevant information as to what led to January 6th riots, much of that information is still being withheld from the public and whereas information about January 6th, where he's 6th, 2021 continues to be withheld from the public. Many citizens, including citizens of this Commonwealth continue to be unconstitutionally detained for exercising their constitutional rights. And whereas the rights of freedom, speech, freedom of assembly and due process are essential to a functioning democracy and constitutionally guaranteed to all citizens. And whereas the Republican party of Kentucky acknowledges that the pressure and duress that many innocent January 6th protesters have endured have been wrongfully accused or detained as prisoners in Washington, D.C., and whose lives and their families have been adversely damaged while exercising their constitutional rights. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Republican Party of Kentucky hereby acknowledges the events of January 6th and recognizes those citizens who have been wrongfully held without due process. Now, nowhere in this resolution, I just read it for you, right? Nowhere in this resolution anywhere does it defend those who actually did illegal actions. What it's pointing out is that this, this Democrat dictatorship of a government that we have before us is using January 6th and making a big, a much larger deal out of other people up there, as in investigating people that just weren't breaking the law, harassing them, FBI raiding their houses. Uh, and it's clearly being used as a political tool and process because we saw and we see none of this for the Black Lives Matter rioters. And that is very comparable. I mean, remember, the, there are January 6 people who just showed up and were in the Capitol building that didn't like do anything that are being charged with trespassing and, um, you know, attempting to, you know, proceed some sort of uh, official uh, proceeding, attempting to enter up an official proceeding that are being charged and sentenced with more than Black Lives Matter writers who tried to light a federal building on fire. They, they lit it on fire, getting less of a sentence than January 6th people did. And that's what they're pointing out. This is, is obviously a political prosecution of many of these people. That is quite clear. And it's repugnant. And, 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 and it is something to call out and point out as wrong. But once again, nowhere in that resolution did it defend anybody who did anything wrong. However, despite the fact that objectively speaking, there are people who have had uh, who've, who've been subjected to government overreach and tyranny because they were simply in the Capitol on January 6th. They've been questioned for just flying to D.C., whether or not they were even a part of it, right? So despite all that, and this objectively true, you look at the thing, you're like, okay, this is, this is objectively speaking, this is accurate. So you look at that and you say, well, what problems could the left have? Did it defend it? No, it didn't defend the actions of those who broke the law. They're calling out people not getting due process, 
calling out people who are being uh, subjected and harassed by the federal government just for expressing their First Amendment rights. That's it. That's it. And that should be something we should all be able to agree upon. That if somebody was really just up at D.C. protesting, but wasn't damaging property, attacking police officers, uh, assaulting other people, that they did nothing wrong. But see, that that's not the worldview. Democrats have, because you're allowed to do things like block interstates, as we see the Free Palestine people doing. You're allowed to do things like assault people. You're allowed to surround Jewish students and yell at them. You're allowed to try to light federal buildings on fire. You're allowed uh, to, to shoot people. It happened at Black Lives Matter riots. You're allowed to light dumpsters on fire. You're allowed to point a gun at somebody and then stand in front of trial saying that somehow that person deserves to be thrown in jail for shooting you, Kyle Rittenhouse. You're allowed to do all of that, and they're perfectly fine with it. But the minute you're expressing a viewpoint now they don't agree with, remember, protests and gatherings were fine when you were protesting police violence because the Democrats said it was okay. But the minute you were protesting and gathering to fight against COVID lockdown measures, well, that was extreme and dangerous because we're in the middle of a pandemic, don't you know? So it's not about what happened. See, see, objectively speaking, if this was going on for Black Lives Matter protesters, I would immediately say, yeah, that's wrong. I have no problem saying that they have a right to gather as long as they're not breaking any laws. They do. But Democrats would never say the same thing. So what has their response been online on Twitter? I posted this. Uh, I was one of the first people to post about it. We'll be going over that as well as just some information on the vote count there that does lead us to ask some questions. After this short break, you're listening to the Andrew Cooperator Show, your source for Kentucky politics, questions, concerns, issues. Feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. We'll see you back here in a short bit. And you're back with the Andrew Cooperator Show. Talking about the resolution the Republican Party of Kentucky put out on January 6th, straightforward resolution, not defending anybody who broke the law, but simply stating that there are people that just simply were expressing their First Amendment uh, rights that are subject to harassment, due process problems, detentions from the federal government that needs to be addressed. And so what has the response been online as I post this out? Well, as you can imagine, the liberals lost their ever living minds. They just lost it. They couldn't handle the idea that people disagree with them. So immediately they respond by saying, I'm not kidding. There's several comments like this that say that I, I read the resolution to you doesn't defend any kind of illegal activity. There are people commenting on this and sharing it out saying that the Republican party of Kentucky and those who voted yes on this should be charged with treason, charged with treason for saying that people are being held by due, without due process and that's wrong, that people should be allowed to express their First Amendment rights. Charged with treason. That's the way they think. That's the tyranny they put forward. There's no, if it, there's no standard. There's no logicalness to it. It's literally, oh, you don't agree with me politically? What can I do to get you thrown in jail? And they call us the extreme party? They call this extreme? Remember, you're suggesting you're committing treason by passing a resolution saying people are being held down due process and that's wrong. What's another common claim? And this is what I love. Anytime you see, you know, we see this on the DEI bill for college, which I, I have a few comments on that here in a second. You see this on the DEI bill for college. You see this on, um, you know, we saw this with critical race theory, CRT, right? We see this with, with all kinds of things, all kinds of things. Uh, bills banning grooming or, or transgender. I mean, we saw this with, with banning uh, uh, surgeries on minors to transition the gender. And what is their common response? Same thing here. They said, none of this is happening. Why pass this resolution? The same thing they say, why pass a bill? This isn't happening. This isn't happening. And it's like, okay, so you agree then is what you're saying is, is that if it was happening, you would agree it's wrong then. Is that what you're saying? If it was happening. Before I, I even attempt to show you the proof and play this whole game of let me show you the proof and everything else for you to just ignore it. Why spend my time bothering to go out there and grab you the proof to shove in front of your face that you probably won't believe in the first place once you see it. But if, if even if I showed you, absolutely, you, you can't deny it. A person sitting in front of you saying, this is what happened. Here's the receipts. Here's the footage of me. 
here's the entire footage of me at January 6th. I did nothing wrong. I stood in the grounds, but yet I was, I was detained. I, I had SWAT raid my house, everything else. If that's, if that's it, if I sat, I literally sat somebody down in front of them. Are you saying that you would then support the resolution? No, of course not. Of course not. And it's the same thing. If I showed you critical race theory is happening, would you say then you'd support the bill? Of course not. If I showed you that the surgeries on minors was happening, which by the way, it was in Kentucky, would you then support the bill? No, of course not. They never would. So it's like they're saying, oh, this isn't happening. But if it is happening, that's a good thing. So you're saying that you don't need to put forth this resolution. You're treasonous for doing it. But also this, this isn't happening. Well, if it isn't happening, but you disagree, if it would be happening, what's the problem here? If it isn't happening, great. It isn't happening. But if it is happening, you'd be against it then, right? Now, of course not. Not for them. They wouldn't be against it. They'd be cheering it on because they do cheer it on. That's when they're common, common thing. Of course, others, oh, it's funny. All those treacherous losers are in jail because, of course, expressing your First Amendment right. You know, it's just, it's just, you see all these constantly, it, it, they can't look in a mirror. These liberals can't look in a mirror and they don't realize how crazy they sound. Now, there's another comment here I have on this. So I'm glad Robert Benvenuti allowed this to come forward. New chair, exciting stuff, exciting stuff that he even allowed this debate to happen because under old, they wouldn't because, and, and, and the reason why they wouldn't is because those people, this pass, by the way, with a vote of, was it 34 to 32 is what this vote? Yeah. 34 to 32. So it passed by only two votes. That means fully half of the executive committee of the Republican party of Kentucky that was at that meeting, not the executive committee, sorry, the state committee at that meeting, which is made up of hundreds, but those are the people who showed. 32, half of them that showed up wouldn't support a resolution that didn't even defend the actions of those who did illegal things on January 6th. That shows you how they think. And, and the part of the reasons why is because they're worried about these responses right here. They're worried about the liberals losing their mind. I, got, I don't know how to get it through their thick skulls, but they will never vote for you. No matter what you do, these Mitch McConnellites who say, we need to be the the adults in the room, blah, 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 blah. We can't say this. People might get mad at us. Blah, blah, blah. They're never voting for you in the first place, but your base, the people who keep you in office, the people who turn out to vote for you, the people who volunteer for your campaigns, the people who donate to your campaigns, the masses, not the political donor class that really run a lot of the things in Frankfurt, but the masses, they support this. And that's who matters. You're, you're never going to get their support. Stop thinking you will. And, and passing things like this and then watching their huge response to it when you read it and you don't see any kind of defense of illegal activity in there, but yet you see people saying, this is treasonous, throw the Republican Party of Kentucky people in jail for passing this, right? When you see that, it does expose them for the radicals they are. And it does help win the middle of the road over to the side of being like, yeah, I mean, I don't like what happened either, but man, these people are crazy. They want to throw people in jail just for an opinion. Wow. That's not the kind of country I want to live in. You know, they say, come together, love everyone. As long as you have the right viewpoint, we can love you. As long as you have the right viewpoint. But 32 to 34, 34 to 32. Wow. 32, almost half. Unwilling to do conservative work. But that's what the problem is. We've got to work this out of the party here in Kentucky. We've got to work these people out. What does that require? How do we do that? Well, it starts by you getting involved, making sure you have conservative chairs and making sure you have conservative elected officials because elected officials, as well as uh, every chair and vice chair, as well as a few others, are all members of this executive, of this uh, state committee. They're all members. And by ensuring that you are electing conservative people, you're ensuring that the right people end up sitting on that, that board, end up sitting in that room getting to vote on this and can push out those who aren't conservative. They're not really Republican anymore. Why are they still in the party? Well, I tell you why they're still in the party. It's because it's a social club to them. For those of you who wonder, why do these quote unquote rhinos, not real Republicans, why do they stick around so much? It's because they're, it's a social club. They miss the fact that the politics they do, the governments they do, the, the people they vote for, 
they they're more than just people who you like or don't like personally. The decisions they make affect literally millions of people. And if you're in politics for it to be a social club, you're in it for the wrong reasons. And you're kind of what's wrong here. You should not be supporting you. I personally like several representatives, like as a person, I think they're awesome people to generally hang around with. I think they've got great attitudes, generally speaking. I love to get a beer with them. Vote awful. Absolutely vote off on what they're for and against is absolutely something I don't agree with. And when a primary comes up and I have the chance to support somebody against them, I would. While I may personally like them, it's not about whether or not I like them. It's about are they doing the job that I've quote unquote hired them to do or their constituents hired them to do? Are they executing the Republican conservative principles properly? Are they doing that or not? And if they're not, well, then that is what needs to be addressed. Well, coming up in our last segment, uh, we're going to go over that DEI bill, that K-12 through DEI bill. I've, I've got some thoughts here, mainly being, uh, why are we only addressing DEI in college? We have a pervasive and huge issue in our K-12 through education here in Kentucky. I'll go over just how big of a problem it is. And I will ask that all-important question, why aren't we including getting rid of DEI in our K through 12 education. Why are we only talking about public universities? We'll have that after this short break. You're listening to the Andrew Kubretter show, your source for Kentucky politics. Want to reach out to the show? Feel free to email info at the show.com. Once again, that is info at the show.com. And welcome to the Andrew Kubretter show. Final segment here uh, before the break kind of tease what would be going over. But uh, as many of you are aware, there was a Senate bill six, filed about dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in our public universities, dealing with those colleges. And that's great. That's awesome. We should be dealing with that. However, however, I do have a question of why are we going to post-secondary education, something that is optional or, or, or college education, something optional, well, ignoring or leaving behind the very huge DEI problem we have going on in our public schools that basically people have to go to. I mean, people could choose, of course, to homeschool or private school, but if you don't have the means and, and the time, and while people like you and me, maybe, if, if you're somebody who has means or time, you may find the time to homeschool your kids and find that to be important, or you may not. That's okay, too. I understand it takes time. But we're talking about the masses, too, as well. They're not necessarily going to homeschool their kids either or put them in private schools. They're going to send them to their public schools, which where they're being indoctrinated in this DEI stuff. So you have a, a organization that Basically, everybody has to go to, right? 80% of our kids go to in Kentucky, 75-ish percent of our kids go to. Compared to our universities, which, you know, I think, what, not even half of people are going to college in Kentucky, especially as that's been dropping, right? So you have something they're going to, and we're just ignoring the DEI issue in in the public school system here in Kentucky, at least you think it's not. I mean, look, this is from the Board of Education's website. They have an entire diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging department full of Kentucky's equity toolkit, Kentucky's equity dashboard, resources and trainings, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging communities of practice, elevate student and educator voice. For those of you who don't know what DEI is, it's this I ideology that you should be judging people based upon immutable characteristics like their gender and skin color, and then treating people differently based upon their gender or skin color, you know, sexism and racism. It offers up a bigotry of low expectations as well. And this is, this is a, a concept that says that if you're a minority, you are somehow inherently disadvantaged to white people, which just isn't true. One, it removes the individualism of everybody. Because as we've discussed on the show, and I'm sure as you intrinsically realize that a, a poor white kid from Appalachia and a uh, high socioeconomical class uh, coming from a, a rich family black kid in anywhere that but is coming from a rich family, they have the, the, the black kid come from the rich family has more advantages, even without DEI, than the poor white kid in Appalachia does. So it doesn't have to do with skin color. It's got to do with a lot of other things, but they're focusing on immutable characteristics. They're focusing on racism. 
And so we see this in our K through 12 education. I mean, we have, we have members. You've got Thomas Woods Tucker. He's the deputy commissioner and chief equity officer. He's getting paid around 140 K a year. Damien Sweetie, he's getting paid big bucks, 80 K a year. His title is diversity director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. He was getting paid more. I pulled up their salaries in a past show. So you'll have to go back and listen to one of those from my Festivus report. You got Malika T. Williams. She's getting 50, 60 K a year. She's the, she's a part of the DEIB coordinator. She's a, she's a coordinator for them. They're spending like 200 grand, just, just right there. More than 200 grand. They're spending like 300 grand just right there in those salaries every year of your tax dollars on DEI stuff with that in the title. On top of that, they have right here, the communities of practice, regional coordinators. They say in 2021, this is according to Department of Education's website. In 2021, the Kentucky Department of Education hired, they use the words hired, diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging coordinators at each regional cooperative. The cooperative provides comprehensive educational services and programs that support the regional district. So it's not just this three, they have this entire thing of coordinators. Actually, I got a list of them here. There's, what is it, eight? <laughs> Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, there's eight coordinators. But see, what did they say? They say they hired them, right? This is what's real odd too. This tells me something, something, something's going on. Something's not right here. So I can go find these three salaries, the the director, the commissioner, the coordinator salaries. When I go on and do a salary search on the, the tool, there's a tool put out by the treasurer's office where you can search any public employee's salary. They use the word hired. Well, I search these names. They're not coming up anywhere. Some of them are working for our public school systems. They don't come up anywhere, anywhere. Their salaries come up. So you have no idea how much they're paying them. I, I think this relates back to several contracts that passed a few years ago in 2021. And if that's the case, if that's them, you're talking millions that is going out to DEI stuff there. And what's the net result of that? Well, the net result here, here's, here's one of their, their things. Here's what's that, what's that money go to? What do they push forward? Here's, here's one of their points here. The climate and culture of the school sets the tone for student experience. Caring adults and peers are critical to provide each student and adult with a sense of belonging. Connectedness to the school is a protective factor associated with higher academic achievement, better attendance, and reduced risk behaviors. Often, different student groups vary in their sense of belonging in the school. So let's rewind here. Okay, so they hired these people in 2021. It's now 2023. So they say that by doing this, they're going to have better behavior and achievement, attendance, so on and so forth. Let me ask you, has the net result of our schools been better attendance, achievement, and behavior? Certainly not in Louisville public schools. We know that. I mean, you've got bus drivers sicking out over what, how ridiculously behaved these kids are on the bus. So certainly not there. Didn't make a difference. I don't know about your local school district, but these, this literally millions that they've spent on this since 2021 has resulted in everything getting worse. Why? Because you're, the schools, one, shouldn't be involved in this. Your job isn't to make kids feel like they belong at school. Your job is to teach the kids. That's it. You're not there to raise the kids. You're not there to worry about their emotions. That's their parents and guardians' job. Stay in your lane. And I know some people don't like to hear it. And some people like to be like, well, they don't have a caring adult at home and blah, blah, blah. According to who? You? You don't know that for a fact. For literally decades. Decades. <laughs> okay? Decades. This country, this state didn't have a DEI division. And for decades, it did better academically than it's doing now. And it spent less money. So objectively speaking, it isn't working. And, and a big part of that too is because you're ignoring some of the very key things. By looking at a person's skin color is somehow the reason why they're doing bad. If, imagine, imagine you are a kid who's struggling in school. Right? Imagine, imagine uh, a black kid struggling in school. He, he doesn't understand a math concept, perhaps. And instead of a teacher worrying about how that individual isn't understanding a math concept, 
and then perhaps sending, uh, the, letting the parents know about it. Um, you know, tutoring programs, perhaps suggesting an after-school tutoring program, or just spending more time with that kid because they're underachieving as an individual. You sit there and study them and say, well, they're underachieving in math because they're black. Because that is what DEI says. Do you really think, uh, they look at a statistic and they say, well, black kids are, are more so underachieving in math because they're black. That's what they say. They say black kids underachieve in math, so black kids need special help. No, anybody who's underachieving in math or reading or whatever should get the help, regardless of their skin color. And when you're looking at their skin, and this is the thing, no wonder they're failing in math. These teachers and administrators don't even understand the basic statistical idea of the difference between causation and correlation. They're not failing in math because they're black. One, that's racist. But two, that's not accurate. They're failing in math and they happen to be black. And is there a, a correlation perhaps between a higher number of maybe black kids aren't doing as well in math as white kids are? Perhaps. Yeah, that correlation exists. But do you think it's caused by the fact that they have a skin color that's black? Are you sitting here saying you wouldn't help a white kid who's also struggling in math? Of course not. You should be worried about how each child individually achieves not worried about what box mark. Oh, are you the right gender? Are you the right skin color? Well, if you're not, we can't help you. We're not worried about your academic achievement. That's the message they're sending. And so while I'm very glad that Senator Wilson and, and Senate Bill 6 is dealing that with in colleges, why are we not dealing with that in our K through 12 education where it's running just as rampant and the state has way more reason to get involved there than they would with the, they have more authority to get involved there. I'll say that. Not that they don't have reason, they're both funded by the public. But it's a lot more questionable sometimes their authority in college universities compared to their authority in K through 12 education, which they have absolutely every sense to be able to control everything. You have greater control over students and, and teachers in that system. That's how our laws are set up. Well, y'all, that's what we got time for today on the Andrew Cooper show. Thank you all so, so much for joining me. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Um, have a great rest of your day.